I think that there, there definitely is something going on. These guys aren't crazy. We just don't have a good handle on, on what the problem actually is. So everybody's heard I th about BPH or benign prosthetic hyperplasia. Men over the course of their lifetime will have about a 25% chance of requiring treatment for BPH. There's no question that sexual dysfunction and lower urinary tract symptoms related to BPH are clearly related. Men, as they get older, uh, men who have BPH and, and so-called LUTs or lower urinary tract symptoms will have a greater incidence of erectile dysfunction and vice versa. The problem is, is that conventional medical therapy for BPH, conventional medical and surgical therapy, can have adverse impacts on a man's sexual function as well. So the standard medical therapy for men who are symptomatic as a result of BPH, two classes of drugs primarily. The alpha blockers, of which Flomax is probably the one most commonly used in British Columbia, and the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, of which there's two, Avodart and Proscar. I'm sure most of you have heard about one of those two drugs. So the alpha blockers work by relaxing the smooth muscle of the prostate and the bladder neck. They don't change the prostate size, they don't do anything to the volume or anything like that. They have a very rapid onset of action and it's probably um, first line therapy by most family doctors for treatment of men with lower urinary tract symptoms. The problem is, is that the alpha blocking effect also relaxes the bladder neck and normally the bladder neck contracts at the time of ejaculation so that all the ejaculate fluid comes forward. These drugs in a sense paralyze the bladder neck. So men notice a marked reduction in the volume of their ejaculate and it's quite consistent and quite pronounced and very distressing to men if you don't tell them about it. If you tell them about it, usually they're okay with it. The only real problems it causes is it, it reduces the sensation of ejaculation to some degree uh, and it also can cause fertility problems but most guys in this age group aren't interested in fertility status, they have more sense. Um, the other class of drugs, the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, for testosterone to act on the prostate, it has to be converted by an enzyme into something called dihydrotestosterone. So the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors prevent that conversion. So the prostate, in a sense, sees less of the metabolite of testosterone that it needs to continue to grow. Problem with these drugs Avodart and Proscar is that they can, they can have uh, an effect on libido, on sexual interest, and on erectile dysfunction. The reported incidence is about 5 to 8 percent, but certainly in my practice, I think it's much higher than that. If you tell guys about it, which you're supposed to do, I think a lot of them will come back and say they have that problem, whether it's a, a true effect or not. More recently, uh, studies have shown that over time, men do best from the point of view of the BPH symptom control with combination therapy. So we're putting them on two drugs, Avodart or Proscar, in combination with an alpha blocker for the long term, two drugs which are going to potentially have adverse impact on their sexual dysfunction. So from the, from the point of view of sexual activity, we're not really doing these guys a favor. There have been some really interesting studies out recently showing that and there was one I just read the other day from Vanderbilt University in, in Nashville um, where they treated men with lower urinary tract symptoms without erectile dysfunction. They gave them the PDE5 inhibitors on a daily basis. So one of the Viagra-like drugs they gave every day. And there was a significant improvement in their lower urinary tract symptoms. There are PDE5 receptors throughout the prostate and bladder neck as well. And I think that traditionally the sexual dysfunction aspect of it has been, been kind of swept uh, under the rug a little bit with more emphasis on treating the lower urinary tract symptoms. But this is kind of a novel idea and something that I've um, started to initiate in a few of my patients, just giving them daily PDE5 inhibitors. And Cialis does market um, a lower dose, 5 milligram dose, where the standard dose is 20 milligrams to give them on a daily basis. And of course in men with lower urinary tract symptoms and in men with erectile dysfunction, it can 
address both of those issues quite nicely. I think it's really uh, something that's very interesting for the future. Dr. Elliott talked about the role of testosterone and certainly um, in men who don't respond to the PDE5 inhibitors, um, it's important to check the testosterone level. Testosterone probably has a permissive effect for a lot of these treatments for erectile dysfunction and if you correct a testosterone deficiency, men will have a better response to the PD-5 inhibitors. The problem with testosterone is we don't really know, the, the, the normal range is so big, we don't really know what a normal is for that individual patient. So sometimes if patients are in the low normal range, maybe they've got some symptoms of androgen deficiency, it's worth putting men on some testosterone replacement uh, and trying the PD-5 inhibitors on a trial basis to see if they may have a relative um, hypogonadism. As Dr. Elliott alluded to, and I completely agree with, testosterone you used to have a really bad um, reputation for prostate disorders. It caused prostate cancer, it caused prostate enlargement, it caused men to go into urinary retention, and that's simply not true. In some patients with, with clinically undetected prostate cancer, Testosterone replacement may, f may fuel that to some degree, but certainly if, if you, as best you can, rule out um, an underlying prostate cancer, it probably doesn't adversely impact a man's prostatic health. There are some dangers to using the PD-5 inhibitors and prostate treat BPH treatments here too, and you can imagine what a mess that guy would make in the bathroom. His wife wouldn't be very happy. So surgical therapy for, for BPH, the medical therapies, if you stop the therapy, typically the sexual dysfunction improves. With, with the thir surgical therapy, that's not the case. This is a permanent uh, state that we, uh, we inflict upon patients. Uh, the standard operation for, for BPH, transurethral prostatectomy, results in permanent retrograde ejaculation usually because we're destroying the bladder neck. That bladder neck doesn't close. When a man ejaculates, the fluid goes back up into the bladder. He doesn't get that, the, um, the fullness in the perineum that comes with ejaculation, which results from closure of the bladder neck and closure of the external sph uh, sphincter muscles to cause that pressure in the urethra, which is part of the sexual experience in men. They lose that, and, they, and that to them, to some men, doesn't, doesn't feel the same, and it it's a, has a negative impact on their sexual function. And, in some, and that happens virtually in everybody undergoing transurethral prostatectomy. In some men, I quote about 10 to 12 percent, there can be some probably neural injury. Men with smaller prostates, when the nerves travel on just on the outside of the prostate, you can injure the nerve supply. And, and about 10 to 12 percent of men will have, actually have problems initiating and maintaining an erection, which can also be permanent. <laughs> 